Well, good evening and welcome. It's wonderful tonight to see such a great turnout. Thank you very much for being here. And I have to remind everyone, if you have a cell phone or beeper, would you please turn it off right now? That would be terrific. We don't want that to be a part of tonight's event. Okay. Tonight is divided into four sections. Part one, in part one, each candidate will have two minutes to introduce himself to the audience. In part three, I will read predetermined questions. Candidates at that time will have three minutes to answer each question. This is not a debate. There will be no rebuttals. And we will alternate turns, giving each candidate the same number of opportunities to be first to answer the question and to conclude. The timer, Margaret Hall, who is seated in the front, will use four signs during the three-minute answers. Her first sign is green for go. Then you'll see green again, and that indicates that you have one minute remaining. When yellow comes up, that's your warning. You have three, 15 seconds to wrap up, and then red means stop. In the interest of all, I will strictly adhere to the time limits. Part three is questions from the audience. At approximately 7.30, I'll read questions that have been collected from you. And in the interest of time, unfortunately, we won't be able to use all the questions, but we'll do our best, and the same rules will apply. Part four is conclusion, and will end approximately 8 p.m., and each candidate will be able to conclude with one minute of remarks. Proper decorum will be followed, and disruptions won't be tolerated tonight. We're ready to begin. Part one, introductions. Mr. Bellinger, you will begin with the letter B, so you will begin. You have two minutes to introduce yourself. Are you ready, Margaret? Okay. Okay, uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank Dolce and Deb, thank you. Uh, my name is John Bellinger, and uh, I'm 56 years old. I am a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire with a major in history and political science. I'm a senior account executive in the printing industry, and uh, I've been married for 29 years to my beautiful wife, Therese, who's here and is a lifelong resident of Sheboygan. I've got three kids, uh, Matthew, Charlie, and Megan, and um, I've been an alderman since 2012. I'm the chairman of the Public Works Committee. I'm the chairman of the Building Use Committee. Chairman of the uh, Waterfront Safety Task Force. I'm on the Finance Committee. I am on the, a member of the Transit Commission. Um, I'm also on Public Protection and Safety. And I'm on the Planning Commission as well. And uh, I've been active in politics my whole life. I follow it rather religiously, and it's a passion of mine. And I've enjoyed my time on the council. And I think um, tonight that uh, you'll see that there are going to be some stark differences between Mike and I and our philosophies and how we would like to lead the future of, of the city and uh, hopefully um, convince you to vote for me on Tuesday the 4th. So thank you very much. Mr. Vandersteen. Thank you very much. I'm Mike Vandersteen. Uh, I've lived in Sheboygan since 1973. I moved here to open up a tuxedo shop down the block called Dubois Formalware and managed that for 40 years. During that time, I, uh, I had a couple of different p positions, serving as an alderman, uh, county board supervisor, county board chairman, uh, as well as some citizen committees before I came and ran for mayor four years ago and when moved down the street to City Hall where I, I, I'm working today. Uh, my wife Julie is here. We've been married for 35 years and uh, we raised two children here, Rob and Katie, and both of them have blessed us with a uh, grandchild each, so uh, we're happy to be in that stage of life. As mayor, it's been a great privilege and honor to, to serve you. I appreciate the opportunity to do that. I also um, I uh, want to thank our residents here and at home for selecting me to be your mayor over the last four years. It's been a real honor and privilege. Some of the goals that I've worked on during my term as mayor probably won't come up in the debate, so I'd like to talk about some of them. And one of them is to create more communication between the city and its residents. 
We've done a couple of things. Uh, one of them is the Nextdoor web-based program. It's like Facebook for neighborhoods. It's a new way not only for the city to push things out to its residents, but it's a way for the people that live in those neighborhoods to communicate with each other, which really buttresses our police department's neighborhood policing program. Um, the Sheboygan Press offered me the opportunity uh, about a year and a half ago to start writing a weekly article for the press and I just jumped at that chance because it was an opportunity to let the residents know about some good things that are going on in many city different departments and, uh, and get that information out to people. Uh, the other thing that we did is we just recently started a city e-newsletter and then we also have continued the city desk program which is an hour long show on WSCS. Thank you. Part two, questions. Question number one, what is your long range plan for repairing and maintaining Sheboygan's road? <coughs> Mr. Vandersteen, you'll start. Thank you very much. Um, repairing our roads has been a real priority for all of us. Um, there's a big job to do and you can't do it unfortunately without money. Uh, you can't repair those roads with good intentions as much as you'd like. So over the last year, the City Council has approved several new sources of revenue that we can direct to our roads and, and really uh, make a stab at changing them. Um, the Department of Public Works also took a very proactive approach to changing the way that uh, they operate so that we just we don't have to go out and uh, hire a contractor every time we need to fix a road. They've uh, purchased now a, an asphalt paving machine and a new roller so that with our own crews now we can buy asphalt from Sheboygan County and they don't have a profit margin so we can get that, that product cheaper. Last year the price of asphalt went down $10 a ton at the county's price level and, and Northeast asphalt price went up. So that really helps us keep the cost down on these paving jobs. Uh, we also are, a, are then to, um, to use our own crew and much of that labor is paid for. Some of it will be additional labor as far as summer seasonal help, but we can use our own labor then to repave those roads. Um, some of the projects are still going to be uh, done commercially with uh, contractors and um, we, many of them are state projects because we want to max out all the state money that we can get as well. Uh, we've got a very aggressive program set for this year and we are pr proposing to repave 5.5 mi miles of roads. Now in the last 10 years our average was only 2 miles of roads per year and so this is a huge jump from where we came. We had a couple of years in the middle here where we hit 3 or 3 miles of roads but this is a step in the right direction and we have to continue this for several years. Right now, the city of Sheboygan uh, uses a PACER rating system to evaluate our roads and we have $28 million of projects in the roads that are rated in the three worst categories, number one, two, and three. And on average, this year we're gonna put about $4 million into our road repairs. And when you look at that, that that's not gonna really crack that nut of those roads. So it's gonna be several years before we're gonna work our way out of this problem and we continue, uh, need to continue to to bring those kind of financial resources to solve the problem for the city of Sheboygan. Thank you. Mr. Bellinger. Thank you. Um, I, I take a different approach to this. Uh, we've, this, this past year, uh, legislatively, there's been some um, work that's been done for revenue streams for the roads. We've got the extended garbage fee. Um, that's been extended indefinitely, and that's $1.1 million. We have the wheel tax that was enacted a year ago, and now it's got a full <coughs> year of, of revenue collection. That's $800,000 to $880,000 of new revenue. Um, and then we have um, the, our favorite thing is the county sales tax, which we all thank the county for imposing on us. That's $412,000. So we've got $2.3 million worth of new revenue that we did not have previously for the roads. The roads have been neglected in you know, the previous couple decades you could go back and look at. So we are paying for some of the sins of our forefathers. But we have this, uh, we've gone to the taxpayers, we feed them and tax them enough. We have enough source of revenue for the roads moving forward. So uh, what we need to do is we need to prior prioritize better, get our major roads that everybody travels on, the collector streets, the high volume streets, get those fixed in an excellent to good condition and keep them that way 
and that way the visitors that come in and the perception of everybody else within the city will be much better than the current perception is. And the second uh, issue that, that I have with, with the roads is the, um, the special assessments that are levied. So if, if you have a street that you live on and the city is going to now pave it, in the past they have never ever special assessed for work that the city crews did. Now because we've got this new paving machine and they see it as a source of revenue, they say, okay, we're going to all of a sudden start a special assessing. We only in the past special assessed for work that was contracted out by a third party. But now we're looking at special assessing, you know, all the work that we do. And I'm looking to eliminate that. With the wheel tax, the garbage fee, and the sales tax, and the bonding that we do, which is excessive as well. That's over 200% more than we've ever borrowed this year. Uh, you know, so I, I would like to limit that as well. But there is enough source of revenue to deal with our roads in a fiscally responsible manage, manner and not borrow ourselves out of this problem and double our debt and put our bond rating in jeopardy to try to fix this. Thank you. On to question number two. It still has to do with roads. And Mr. Bellinger, you'll answer first. Do you favor eliminating property tax assessments to abutting properties when roads are paved? Please explain your position. Are you talking special assessments? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I think I covered that a little bit. Uh, I feel very passionate about this. Um, I happen to be in the district where Eisner Avenue was just recently done a couple years ago, and the, ex the assessments on the homeowners in that, on that street were excessive. Um, that was a complete re redo of the street, and uh, so it was a little bit different. But what happened on that street was you've got part of the street is town people that live on it, and the, uh, about a third of it, and about two-thirds of it, city uh, residents lived on it. So when it came time to assess, the town said, well, we're not going to assess the people that live on Eisner Avenue. We're just going to pay for it out of the general fund. And what it did was it pit neighbor against neighbor. And I got phone calls from a, a lot of angry neighbors, you know, when this went on. And it, it became a very contentious issue. I had one woman who was an elderly woman who was a widow on a fixed income, and she was you know, it was just the saddest, saddest tale that, you know, that she, she was just barely making ends meet at the end of her life. She barely drives at all anymore, and she's supposed to come up with thousands and thousands of dollars to fix the roads. And, and I just think with our new revenue streams that we have, I don't think it's an equitable or a, a responsible or fair way to you know, move forward with, with, a, with special assessments. I think it is something that we can easily get out of right now with the, this year with the new revenue streams that we have. Uh, it, it hurts the, the most vulnerable people that we have, the low income and the fixed income. And I just think that we need to do something about it. And I'm going to be speaking about it in greater detail tomorrow at the Committee of the Whole. The issue is going to be brought up. Uh, if we look at Camelot Boulevard that's on the future, um, there's some heavy assessments on Camelot Boulevard. Uh, there's going to be uh, assessments for 5000 you know, close to $6,000 for, for each for some of these larger parcels on Camelot Boulevard. And I think it's onerous, and uh, I think we can easily get rid of it and still accomplish all the goals that we need to in fixing our roads because we have enough revenue. Thank you. Mr. Vandersteen. Thank you. Uh, John, earlier you talked about revenue streams, and uh, unfortunately the garbage fee isn't really a new revenue stream, it's an existing one, and it's not there into perpetuity. And I believe it has a sunset on it of several years. So uh, you, when, you, when you do that, you really need to deduct that $1.2 million from the total you gave us of new revenues. Um, I think uh, Eisner Avenue was definitely a different situation because it was a first-time road. It had never been assessed before, and yes, it is more expensive because of that factor, but most of the roads that we're doing, uh, Eisner, I think, came out to around six to $7,000 uh, per lot, and most of the ones that we're doing on Camelot, those were around 1000 to maybe $1,700 per home. Now, there are some corners, but they have corner credits and other things available. So uh, we also finance that for five years for those individuals at 1% above what we pay for the bonding issue that we have. 
These assessments have gone on forever in Sheboygan, and maybe that's not a reason to continue them, but you have to factor in the, 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 the opportunity. You're going to have other people that have paid these assessments over a long period of time who are going to say, hey, I want my money back, and you have to factor that into it when you start to eliminate them. It's, it's not as easy as just uh, pulling the plug and not doing it anymore. The other thing is right now the assessments that we get in are using to pay off the debt that we took on to borrow uh, for, to build those roads and that's right now about a three hundred thousand dollar hit to our um, our debt payments so we're going to have to make that up somehow as well now the assessments that we're doing uh, in these aggressive programs are not going to be at the three hundred thousand level they're going to be getting closer to five hundred and six hundred thousand dollars a year uh, because of the expanded programs but the city needs to have the, the, the taxpayers support of these programs as well as these new revenues that we have in order to really fix our roads if we don't have these and we start to pull things away way uh, we're not going to get that 5.5 miles of roads fixed we're only we're going to lose about 20 to 25 percent of that project if we get rid of assessments so I don't think this has been thought through real well it seems like a last minute uh, idea that John brought up and I, I think it's it's one that should be defeated by the council thank you we'll give Margaret a minute to set up and Mr. Vandersteen you'll answer this next question first Number three, Sheboygan City Hall is in need of better access and function. What is your view of plans for renovating City Hall? Well, when st this project started, I was really in favor of staying at City Hall, and I still think that it could be a viable option, but we've been looking at other uh, ways to try to, uh, to, to make sure that this is not too expensive for this, uh, all of our citizens in the future. And there are some possibilities out there, and I think those need to be fully investigated before we move ahead and see if that, there are some options that will give us a building that we can use for the foreseeable future that has the proper amount of room and works well for City Hall operations. If that's not available, then I support the concept of uh, remodeling City Hall and, and staying there and, and putting enough money into it so that that building will last for another 100 years. Um, you know, we've been given a quote of $8 million, but I remember talking to Joe Richardson after he remodeled and restored the I.C. Thomas drugstore building, and he said, Mike, I finally figured out how to handle one of these historic renovations. He said, take the biggest quote you have and triple it, and that's what it's going to cost you. So we're going into this with uh, a good estimate, but there's uh, things that you're going to discover as you start to deconstruct and change that building that are going to drive that cost up even more. So that scares me a little bit. Thank you. And we'll <coughs> hold. Okay. Ready, Mr. Bellinger? Thank you. I, I need to correct one thing that Mike previously said, and, <coughs> and that was on the garbage fee. He is completely inaccurate. The garbage fee was uh, dumped in, the, in previous years into the general fund and used indiscriminately. It was not specifically targeted for roads. So now when the council re-established it and, and uh, extended it, its, its sole use is for roads. So it is new revenue, and the $1.1 million would count for it. Now getting on to uh, City Hall. I am the chairman of the Building Use Committee. Um, I've, I've looked at uh, the option of... Wisconsin Bank and Trust. I've looked at the option of uh, Wells Fargo. I've looked at all the other options in the city. We're having a meeting on April 12th to, to further uh, come together and make a recommendation to council. It is my opinion, after looking at everything that has been brought forth, that uh, City Hall should be, remain City Hall and the dollars should be spent to keep it as a city hall and make it as functional and as useful as a modern day city hall can be made. And there is a lot of inefficiencies right now within the current city hall um, and the way it's laid out, uh, the, um, some of the walls and some of the configurations. If we are to put some money into it and make it e as efficient as possible, we will have a, a one-stop shop where we can have the taxpayers or the, the residents of the city come in and do business at one counter, whether it's uh, uh, you know buying a license, paying a ticket, you know wh whatever it is, uh, they can get the point of entry and the, the first contact will be a counter that they can do their business with. The other offices and the council chamber will be up in the you know subsequent floors, but uh, I think it has historical significance. And looking at the other options, they are either cost prohibitive 
or um, do not meet our functional needs moving forward. And therefore, I think what, what's going to be the recommendation, I believe, um, is going to be to, to look strongly at remodeling City Hall and using what we have and finding a way that uh, we can uh, continue to do business in the year that it would take to, to remodel City Hall. Thank you. We're going to move on to question number four. Mr. Bellinger, you'll be the first one to respond. What is your plan to revitalize Sheboygan's downtown, Indiana Avenue, and Michigan Avenue? Well, I, I think uh, business uh, revitalization, um, that corridor, the Indiana corridor, is a, in, an arts corridor or that's deemed an arts corridor, so there is some significance that, with that. You've got everybody coming and going from Blue Harbor that uses Indiana corridor. There is some blight that would nice, be nice to get cleaned up and, and to clean that up. Um, what I would do is I, I would continue to work with developers and, and work with um, and recruit new businesses, whether it's um, art centric or um, hospitality, you know, anything like that. We just went through and we struggled mightily to get the Founders Club, um, you know, un up and going and, and help them with their funding. And, and it shouldn't be that hard when you've got somebody with that unique of an idea <coughs> and, and you've got all these businesses that are looking to have a place where they can have seasonal or interns or temporary work and have them housed in a place that is um, economically feasible for them. So we've got that off the ground. I would like to do more things like that. Uh, one of the things that, that I would like to do is, um, you know, that would include, you know, the downtown, the um, Michigan corridor and the Indiana corridor, is I would work closely, I would put together a task force and uh, work closely with the businesses and with the PGA and with Kohler on the uh, Ryder Cup in 2020. Um, if you saw what happened in Chanhassen and Chaska, Minnesota, in how they routed traffic, how they closed schools for a week, how they, all the businesses thrived after that, when they've had U.S. Opens there previously where things didn't go very well, and all the merchants and the businesses stocked up and, and they didn't see any of the uh, anticipated revenue coming in, it really turned around this year. So I would put together a task force. I would uh, have some uh, significant... Um, capital put forth to uh, clean up the city in strategic areas that would highlight and really shine for Sheboygan for the because the world is going to be looking at, uh, at us at tw in 2020 and we really need to have the focus and have you know the people that are visiting come back through Sheboygan and use the amenities patronize the businesses and restaurants and bars and bread and breakfasts and, and everything else that we have and just really make it just a wonderful experience because the future economic development that could come from this could be tremendous. Thank you. Mr. Vandersteen. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, we have worked very hard with our business improvement district, uh, the Sheboygan Squared Group. Um, and with them, we put a, a master plan together for our downtown and South Pier. And we've done so many of the different implementation steps. We have uh, wave finding directions. We have uh, a transit uh, trolley that now runs a route to circulate the traffic from Blue Harbor and a marina and everything downtown. The other thing that we're doing that's really going to be the key to this uh, area being successful is continue our housing developments. Uh, we have two great projects, uh, one at South Pier and one here in the old uh, Boston store site that are, uh, are getting pretty close to both of them are 50% are pre-leased. And we have a new project on South A Street and the St. Cyril site that should break ground soon this, uh, this spring. Now those projects are going to be bringing people to live down here and that's really going to change the dynamics. Hopefully it's going to be a big enough dynamic that we can actually get a grocery store downtown, but we need to have more critical mass in this area before things like that are going to happen. It will also make this area much more attractive for business. Um, and and it's, it, we have to have a, a real exciting and dynamic uh, central city area in order to really bring people into this community to stay here. Uh, there's a lot of jobs in this area and so that works well with it as well. Now our, 
our cooperation with the Business Improvement District has done a lot of beautification already. We've uh, taken the alleyways and tried to make them more friendly. There's now lights that are strung above the alleys. We also have flower pots and we have uh, more flowers that we put on the light poles and that's only going to be enhanced further this coming year. We've also tried to take the uh, uh, area around the uh, water feature and make that more friendly for people to just hang out in, have lunch, uh, you know, get some kind of a drink, uh, coffee or whatever, and enjoy that area. So it's going to be those kind of synergies and, um, you know, the, the more housing, uh, the businesses, and that's really going to make this area more attractive. We're already seeing a lot of investment in several of the commercial buildings. Uh, we, we've had several new businesses move in. There's a, a new business on the upper floor of the old uh, Dirksy building. Uh, we've got the new uh, yarn shop that just opened up. Uh, Olive Wu is supposed to be expanding. So there's a lot of neat projects that are already taking place and uh, this area is just going to continue to grow. The other thing that we did recently was, uh, was put together a project with the John Michael Kohler Art Center for the Levitt Amp Concert Series and that's going to continue and only make this area more dynamic and better. Well, you know, I really think that uh, we missed the boat as a city council when we didn't hire an opera a company to do an operational review of our fire department. We really need to have some outside feedback that tells us what a good fire department should be doing with their staffing and many other aspects of the fire department. Right now we have a situation where the chief wants to do this, the union doesn't want to see him do it, the union's gone out for a study, and, and so the, I think the, the council is really kind of uh, in a quandary as to what to do. And we need somebody to sort all this out for us. Uh, I, I've seen many opportunities in the past where municipalities have spent good money on a company that comes in and evaluates their entire operation and gives them recommendations of things to implement. And almost always that has made those organizations better. And sometimes you need that person from the outside to point out the obvious. And I think that may be the case here. And so I really am looking forward to the discussion tomorrow night at the Committee of the Whole. And I hope the outcome of that is to hire that consultant so we can get some good advice and, and come up with a plan that's going to last for many years in our fire department. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thank you. Um, Six years ago when I was first on the council, I introduced this idea to have a study. I spoke with uh, then uh, the fire chief, Herman. He was against it. Um, I told him what I wanted to do, what I wanted to accomplish, that I didn't have any preconceived um, outcome of, of the study, but uh, I thought that we should have a plan moving forward for the next five to ten years. And, uh, you know, he didn't support it at the time, but he was very um, forthright with me and I was with him. Um, I did the same thing again this year. The, the study that Mike is referencing is, is my um, uh, resolution and uh, I put together the RFP to come up with this. I went to the chief, Mike Romas, this time and asked him if he would support it and if he would participate and uh, help put the RFP together in the scope of work that would be needed. Uh, at the time he was enthusiastic about it. He said, great, more information the better. Uh, it's just going to only reaffirm everything that we already know, that we're the greatest fire department in the world and that uh, just the status quo is just the greatest thing ever. So, um, you know, that's what he said. Then I met with the uh, uh, Chase Longmiller, the uh, head of the union. I told him what I wanted to do and he said uh, he would support it on one condition and that would be that I didn't have a predetermined outcome and uh, whatever the findings were that the council would do their best to <coughs> follow those recommendations and fund them, you know, however, you know, necessary to move forward. I told him that um, absolutely I agreed with that. I don't have any preconceived idea of how the fire department should be run. The unfortunate problem here is that nobody here is an expert on public protection and safety uh, in the leadership of the, of the council of uh, the mayor's office, of the city administrator. It's an expertise that we don't have. And anything coming out of the union or the fire chief is going to be biased in some certain way or it's going to appear that way. So we really need to move forward with an independent study. I've talked with Fitch and Associates, who was the recommended 
um, uh, vendor to provide the study for us. Uh, I talked with them yesterday or on Friday afternoon, and uh, he confirmed to me that the price was still good as long as the scope of work did not change. And so they can do concurrently, they can complete the study, phase one and phase two, uh, in six months and, and, and get us everything at the same cost that, that they previously quoted. So I'm 100% in favor of, of moving forward because what we're getting out of the fire department right now is bickering between the union and management and it's not moving the city forward in any meaningful way. Mr. Bellinger, you'll answer question number six first, and it is, how do you plan to retain and service companies that want to expand? Uh, well, I, I certainly, you know, if I were fortunate enough to be elected mayor, um, I would have a strong relationship with the business leaders in the community and the CEOs, the, the CFOs, uh, the HR directors, and I would have a pulse and know what's going on and I would be able to anticipate their needs and certainly I would have regular conversations with them and, and see what their, their future um, goals are. I would have a clear understanding of their mission statement. Um, we've got an, um, a company here in Sheboygan that's headquartered here that's you know relatively uh, flies under the radar and that's HSA Bank. Uh, they reside in the, you know the tallest building in Sheboygan. They've got several floors there. They're always looking to expand. They've uh, exhausted um, uh, some work here. They couldn't expand any further here due to ser several reasons and they've outsourced that to Milwaukee. So I would work with people like that and see what we can do to have them expand uh, and stay here and get those jobs here and get more people here, get more people downtown, more people eating lunch downtown, buying goods, so on and so forth. Um, we've got something going on with the, you know, possibly with uh, the Affordable Care Act nationally and uh, health savings accounts could be a very big solution to that problem and if that expands and explodes uh, uh, they're in a great position to expand and even you know you know do some greater things than they're already doing uh, they've got some parking needs and some requirements that need to be met you know we need to work with them to see what we can do as a city to accomplish what they what they need to move forward um, there's some other things that we need to do too when companies come to us like Masters Gallery, we need to be uh, proactive with them and understand what's going on and not miss out on an opportunity where we've got a company that wants to spend, put a three, $30 million facility up and bring 120 million jobs or 120 jobs here and uh, they choose to go down the road to um, Oostburg. But we've funded a project or a, uh, a study for the Southside Business Park and uh, parcels that are south of that yet too to see what we can do to attract businesses in the future and help businesses expand. But the businesses that we have here at home within the city limits, we need to take care of, nurture, be on top of, have great relationships with, and have a pulse in knowing what they need in the future, anticipating them, and then doing what we can to help them grow and move forward. Thank you, Mr. Ballinger. <coughs> Mr. Vance, Thank you. Um, our economic development is so important uh, and that's why we banded together with uh, not only um, other municipalities but uh, with our business community and started the Sheboygan Economic Development Corporation. When I came in as mayor, uh, Mayor Van Akron hadn't uh, become a member of that. We were giving him $100,000 a year as part of our contribution but he didn't take advantage of it so I immediately changed that and both myself and the administrator at the time and currently are, are voting members of that group. Uh, we participate fully with them uh, in our chamber to try to build those, those partnerships and, and they really keep tabs on many of these companies all the way around, all around our county and help our planning department work in tandem with them to not only look for the opportunities to bring new companies in but more importantly to help those companies that are in Sheboygan grow here so they'll stay here. Um, you know a beautiful example of that was the old Wisconsin sausage. 
The city went and bought some additional land on the other side of I-43, and Old Wisconsin had a company that they hired to, to build the new plant for them. They wanted to keep it under wraps for a while, but uh, that all worked out, and we have a beautiful new facility there that Old Wisconsin is occupying, and they're also expanding their, their current facilities in Sheboygan, too, so they're not abandoning those other ones. So we have to, uh, I think that's the, the first priority is to continue to work with our existing businesses to expand and, uh, and keep those jobs here in Sheboygan. Um, the SCD, CEDC has had some great strides in the things that they've done for Sheboygan. Uh, they've, they've been involved in almost every economic project that we've done recently, and it's a great partner for the city as we go forward. Thank, Thank you. you. On to question number seven. Mr. Vandersteen, you'll answer first. What is your plan to attract and retain young talent to Sheboygan? Well, we talked a little bit before about our downtown and, and uh, central city area. We really have to make that attractive uh, place for them to stay here and want to be here. We've got a lot on our lakefront that uh, really lends itself to, uh, to bringing the youth in, you know, with our trails that we have and the many other opportunities. Um, and then things like the, the Levitt Amp Concert Series. That makes our area a little bit more dynamic, dynamic over uh, the course of a year. Now, we're going to have that space uh, just starting construction on that. Uh, we call the, we're going to call it the City Green uh, in the next week or two. And uh, we need to find other events like that to round out the use of that space so there's things happening there um, many days of the week as we go through our summer season. The other thing that I think we need to do is, is reach out to some of the people that grew up in Sheboygan. Now, I don't know if we can do something through reunion groups, but, you know, it seems like the five to ten year reunion time kind of time frame is a time where some of our youth that were born here and raised here and went out off someplace to work might want to think about coming home. They may be married by that time. They may be thinking about raising a family. They may have family back here that, that needs uh, some help, and it would be nice if they were in the area to do that. And I think that, um, you know, we've, when we talk about our workforce development issues, if you can bring somebody in from Minot, North Dakota to work a job here for a while, it's likely that, you know, when there's a job opening in Minot, he's probably going to go back there. He's not going to stay here forever. But if you can find some of the people that grew up here in Sheboygan, and if you can bring them back home during that point in their life, they're likely to stay here for the rest of their life because they know what Sheboygan is when they grew up. They know how valuable this community was and the, the, the hominess and uh, the, the, the things, the attractions that we have here. And now they can share those with their kids, and they can have the same kind of upbringing that they did when they were here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bellinger. Thank you. Um, attra attracting and keeping young people, it's, it's always kind of a, a, a challenge, and it has been a challenge for us as a city in the past. But I think one of the greatest success stories that we have, I mentioned it before, is the Founders Club. Yeah, this is a, a dormitory style housing development that used to be a retirement home that has not been on the tax rolls for 47 years. The Schmitz brothers' father built this building. Uh, they want to uh, repurpose it and, and use it for seasonal and um, you know uh, seasonal students, um, you know that type of work, and uh, um, interns, you know somebody that's going to be here on a temporary basis for three to six months, maybe a year, and rent, that, rent those out. And so we're attracting young people that way. We've, we've got this building going on with uh, the Boston Store site with Oak Brook. There's going to be a new, a new development on, on South A Street that's going to be breaking ground soon, hopefully. And we've got uh, Portscape Apartments. So there's a lot of young people or a lot of density that's moving towards the downtown and moving here. What I think we also need to do is we need to actively recruit a four-year university to be part of our downtown, whether it's Lakeland, Marquette, Cardinal Stritch, UWM, uh, you know, University of Wisconsin, and have them offer graduate-level programs for uh, the, the youth that we have that are here. You've got people that come in here, they start their jobs, they're working at Kohler, they're working at, at acuity, you know, and they want to be able to do something to further themselves and they need to have further education to be able to do that. 
We're a city of 50,000 people. Are, you know, we've got 100,000 people in the county. We should be able to have a site like that that's here within our city limits to be able to take advantage of it. We could do something with UWM, with uh, the marine, the lake shore, or the sanctuary, the marine sanctuary, with, uh, they've got a uh, freshwater institute down in Milwaukee. Maybe they could have a satellite here in, in Sheboygan. We've got uh, tons of fresh water here in Sheboygan. So uh, I would do things like that. I would be very creative. I would think outside the box. I would do some things that would attract young people and you know, not only keep them for a short period of time, but get them interested and say, over a long period, I want to stay here. I want to live here. And, in, and having that educational opportunity, I think, would be key to that. Thank you. Mr. Ballinger, you'll answer question number eight first. All voices should be heard in city government. What is your plan to encourage and include women, young adults, and members of our various ethnic communities to serve on committees and participate in city government? Um, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, I addressed that when I was interviewed by my Sheboygan. What I would do is I would put together a, um, not necessarily a task force, but a committee that would have uh, different ethnic backgrounds represented and uh, then, you know, hopefully with that, they could build awareness of what's going on within the city and uh, what's going on at the council level, get them involved, maybe get them to run for an office, uh, appoint them to different committees that they would have an interest in and, and, and see where that leads. So um, I, I think, you know, we've, we've got some, some ways to go in that area and I, I've noticed it and, you know, I, I know that it needs to be addressed, and, and I think that's a, that's a great start, you know, to get, get people active and moving towards that direction. Um, a, city government, politics has a negative connotation, so if you can kind of, you know, remove some of that, get people involved, uh, there's a lot of great committees that, th that they could be on and, and get them started off. I, I think that that would move, you know, forward and, and help out their ethnic community. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it would be a win-win for the city and a win-win for, you know, the different ethnic communities as well. Thank you. Mr. Vandersteen. Thank you. Um, I guess you know, I really think we, we are reaching out to many of those groups. The Hmong community, um, you know, we, uh, I, I go to all of the uh, festivals that they have, uh, not only the summer festival, but the, uh, the New Year's festival. I also go on uh, Vu Yang's uh, program uh, on a bi-monthly basis to talk about city issues. Uh, and, you know, you go there and he asks you a question and then he translates the question plus your answer. It's a long process, but you know, there's many people that have trouble uh, with uh, translating, uh, you know, the Hmong language. So it's the only way to communicate with some of those people and it's worth the time and effort. I've appointed some Hmong, some Hispanics, um, and many others uh, to different city committees already, and I will continue to do that. Um, we, early on uh, in my term, we, we had some visits here by the Hispanic uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce. They wanted to set up a group here, and I attended those meetings. Uh, we also uh, worked something out uh, with our workforce development, and we reached out to the Hispanic uh, cha uh, Chamber of Commerce in Milwaukee. Uh, that is still a work in progress. It hasn't produced the results that we wanted to yet, but it's something that we're going to continue to work at. And recently up at uh, City Hall last Monday, we had a huge outpouring of, of different uh, ethnic uh, backgrounds in, in relation to the uh, Resolution 200. And I talked to uh, Pastor Abraham and, um, and the other gentleman from the La Frontera group. And uh, we've got a meeting set up in a week to sit down and talk about some of the issues that they have. They'd like to see us do some things with some ID cards and some other things to help all those um, people out so that they, um, they have some things that, that, that they can use to identify themselves and, uh, and not get into any trouble. Uh, some of those things are state solved problems. The city can't issue ID cards on its own, but it's something that will work with our state legislature to try to put in place for us. In Milwaukee County, they rather in the Milwaukee County they do it, but you know the state has separate rules on how Milwaukee County operates versus all the other municipalities, and unfortunately, that's not something that we can do. But it's been a high priority of mine to uh, recognize some of the leaders in those different communities and, and give them appointments and try to get them in 
involved in city government. The best thing I could see is, is some of those people running for aldermen, and I, I continue to cultivate uh, different uh, opportunities to bring people in and see them take those next steps. Question number nine, Mr. Vanderstein, you'll respond first. The National Great Lakes Marine Sanctuary is, propo is proposed to preserve shipwrecks from Door County to Fort Washington for historic, recreational, and educational purposes. How do you see Sheboygan's involvement in the National Great Lakes Marine Sanctuary? Thank you. Um, each community in, in this process, there's five different cities that are involved, are all going to have a little niche that they're going to play. And what Sheboygan is carving out for themselves is sea to space. We want to take advantage of Spaceport and involve that in this program. Um, we've studied the National Marine Sanctuary, the only other one in the Great Lakes in Alpena, Michigan, and, and they have really uh, have a lot of educational opportunities there. We've already started to develop that in the fact that uh, we, they're, they're, they've raised money to buy what they call Science on a Sphere. Now the Science on a Sphere exhibit is basically a white globe in the middle of the room and they have four projectors around the room so they can make that globe look like uh, the planet. They can show, say for instance, one of the data sets might be to show off a seismic event, the resulting shock waves from that, and then the tsunami that results afterwards. So they can show that on a globe and really, you know, take the kids in that class and make them understand these, these concepts real easily. They can also make it look like any planet and, and they have over 500 data sets of information. So that's one part of the education program. The other one we'd like to tackle is ROV competitions, robotic vehicles that will go down to the bottom of a pool and perform a mission. And what this we hope will do will open our, our, our students' eyes to the fact that, wow, I can do this. I can make this happen. And this is a skill that we need people to understand for many of our businesses out there in the manufacturing world. They, they're not doing all this piecework that they used to. The robots are doing that, and we need people that can manage and program those robots. So not only will we preserve those cultural resources, the shipwrecks that are there, uh, there will be a historical aspect to it, but Sheboygan, out of all these communities, is trying to, to tackle the, the technology part of it, and that's what, uh, what our main emphasis is. Now that's going to bring tourism to the area, it's going to bring a lot of school groups who want to come down to Spaceport and experience the Sea to Space exhibits down there. We hope to have a direct link to the NASA training lab that's under the uh, the ocean bottom, and uh, all those things will be neat aspects for our kids to learn from. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to piggyback on, on what Mike has said about <laughs> the, the education. I think that's, that's the key aspect of this. Uh, the marine sanctuary is, when, once it, when it gets through and it meets all the uh, federal legislation and it gets get the designation, um, you know, set, you know, then I think what we need to do is look at the next step. And again, what I'll say is I think we need to have some higher level education, not just with the grade school level in, in that, which I think is good, which Mike, which Mike already talked about. But I think we need to have, you know, some freshwater institute type um, higher level education, biology, things like that, you know, to go along with, with the shipwrecks in the marine sanctuary. We are in an ideal position being located right in the middle geographically of the marine sanctuary. So Sheboygan is the center of the whole thing. So I think from um, whether it's the marine sanctuary having a headquarters, partnering with seas, um, you know, we've got uh, uh, the yacht club, the youth sailing group. We've got a lot of water-based activity. We've got the, the charter fishermen, you know, and, and all that that we can use all of those resources uh, and, and piggyback and, and really, uh, you know, make a lot out of this opportunity. So, you know, but again, I think what we need to do is, on an economic development front, we need to really go after the universities or the, um, the higher education and, and see what we can do to draw them here, attract them, and, and have them set up a permanent site here where they can move this thing forward to take it to the next level. Thank you. Question number 10, Mr. Bellinger. What is your plan for maintaining safe neighborhoods? 
Okay, um, I, I would say that uh, the majority of the neighbors, neighborhoods are, are relatively safe. I don't know of any that um, have habitual um, problems. Uh, I think what the chief has done with his neighborhood policing has been outstanding. Um, I, I know we've, I've got a neighborhood police officer, um, Matt Heimerall, in my neighborhood. I've become to come to know him very well, um, and hopefully other people in different neighborhoods would reach out to the police department and find out who their neighborhood police officer is. The, the, the city has been divided up into geographic areas with a, a, an officer or two, whether it's first or second shift, that's responsible for each neighborhood. That officer goes around and, and, and does his rounds and spends the majority of his time in that geographic area. He knows the trouble homes, uh, the, uh, the potential drug houses. He knows where people have stray dogs or, or are nuisance dogs, uh, where um, I, you know, he, they know everything about the given geography. So when something happens, they've got a pulse on the neighborhood. They know what's going on. So I think that is the way to do um, neighborhood policing and, and keep a pulse of, of what's going on and, and really be proactive and, and try to prevent any kind of um, you know, future bigger, larger problems from, from becoming evident. So uh, I would continue to do that. Um, I would encourage uh, people to go through the Citizens Police Academy and see what the police department is actually doing. I've gone through it. I've done several ride-alongs. It's eye-opening uh, what they encounter every day and, and to see even in, in the neighborhood that, that you live in that you think is relatively safe and, and so if you see things that uh, you weren't necessarily aware of that happen you know, while you may be sleeping. And uh, it, it's, it's really, really interesting and I, I give these officers a ton of credit for what they do in how they handle themselves and how professional they are, how they treat everybody that they have an interaction with. They are outstanding. We are blessed to have a great police department and a great leader of our police department. And I would do everything I could to continue to support his efforts because he's doing a great job. Thank you. Mr. Vandersteen. Thank you. Well, John gave a real good synopsis of the uh, police department's community policing program. But we really need to take other steps. Some of them that I've taken is to start the mayor's neighborhood leadership cabinet. When I came into office, we only had two neighborhood associations. We now have five, and we've got several more in the pipeline right now. We changed the uh, way that uh, Sheboygan Neighborhood Pride worked. They used to try to uh, associate with the, the neighborhoods that had been identified as well as trying to get new ones in. Now the mayor's neighborhood leadership cabinet is dealing all, just with the ones that are our neighborhood associations, and that leaves the Sheboygan Neighborhood Pride uh, more time to act as the recruitment uh, em emphasis and, uh, and try to get these neighborhoods that are meeting maybe once a year or twice a year to become full neighborhood associations. We also put together a grant program for our neighborhood associations to help them put programs together in their, their groups, and it's, it's really paid some big dividends. We, uh, uh, th then the next thing that uh, that we've been able to do is um, is get these um, members together so that they can share best practices. We'll put on a program at every one of those meetings so they're exposed to other things that go on in the city. Like last month, we had Joe Curlin come in, talk about Emerald Ash Borer, and then uh, the the the, pro the uh, city's Park and Rec program. And uh, that was just good experience for them. And it's, those are programs that they can, uh, either if they want to, just bring the information back or they can ask that individual of the city to come to their neighborhood and, uh, and talk about things. The other thing that we did to help these programs out and more communication with our neighbors is put nextdoor.com in. If you're not on uh, that program, it's a great way to communicate with your neighbors. And if you're in that neighborhood that only meets twice a year, this is a way for you to communicate and push information out to all the people in your neighborhood on the things that are going on and communicate with your neighbors. So those are some of the proactive things that we've been doing. Uh, one of the other big projects has been with Habitat for Humanity on Erie Avenue where we've taken a half uh, block of uh, city property and um, turned those over to Habitat and uh, they put three houses up. There will be another house going up this year and once we clean out the east side of that half block area we'll be able to finish that project up and originally there was 
14 uh, homes in that block. They had the most police calls of any area in the city, and we totally turned them around where there will be seven homes on that block when we're finished and it's going to be a much better neighborhood because all the homes will be owned by uh, the people that live there. Thank you. The next question, Mr. Vandersteen, you'll answer first. What portion of the city budget should go to wages and benefits? We are currently at around 82%. What, in your opinion, is the proper level? Well, right now, you know, we've uh, cut back in many of our departments, and I don't see how we can, um, can thin things out much more than we have. We've recently had to make some additions at our police department. Uh, we had to make some additions at our fire department, and we also did in our building inspection department. And those were all good moves. They make us a safer city. It makes us a cleaner city because we have people to do code enforcement on a regular basis, and it, it, uh, it makes those programs more effective. And I just don't see where we're going to be able to cut back dramatically on the labor that we have right now. And, um, and we're going to probably stay around that 80% level. Um, you know, things are, uh, expenses for employees are not going down. We have been proactive with our health plan by going to a high deductible plan. And we're trying to squeeze a little bit out of that so it does, it's not as expensive for the city. It, uh, we're, we're a part of the in-health clinic with Sheboygan County and the Sheboygan Area School District that's taken some of the costs out of it but it's still an expense that we have to offer a good health plan for our employees thank you mr. Bellinger thank you um, I'm, I'm not sure if you can give a percentage you're, you're saying it's 82 percent right now what, what is that you know what the goal should be should it be 70 should it be 75 70 I mean I don't, I don't think um, that would be responsible just to throw out a percentage what I what I think it should be uh, I, I think there's opportunities to to reduce that in in what that number should be uh, you know I think there ne needs to be some further investigation into opportunities that we have that we can reduce some of our costs um, there's some things that we can do um, to get rid of some full-time equivalents. Uh, what we did was with retirements in the assessor's office, we outsourced that. You know, so we don't have, uh, I think, believe there was three or four people in that department. And uh, so we were able to get uh, th those bodies off our payroll and in our benefit plan and have them be part of GROTA and, and have still great service in assessing capability within the city for them to to access but uh, they're no longer city employees there may be other opportunities that we can look at too where we could outsource or take care or take advantage of early retirement um, there's act 10 that we can look at um, to gradually get uh, the employees to uh, you know be paying more and more for their health care benefits and getting more in line with the the private sector uh, it's not something that we can do um, you know immediately and say okay boom right away you're gonna do it but over time we can inch them towards that and and be respectful and still give raises and, and do things that we need to do um, in the past I've looked at outsourcing or privatizing the uh, the garbage service we have private companies that, that can do that and why we're still in the garbage service you know I don't know I, I tried to get rid of it a, a number of years ago um, and, and it would be slightly more expensive for uh, the individuals to contract and do that but at the same time if you look at the overall uh, scope of things if at 500,000 a crack for a, for a uh, garbage truck and we have six of them that are running every day um, that becomes quite costly and that was not factored into the the equation at the time when that was looked at but there, there are other opportunities that we can can look at and I think we need to have an aggressive HR department and department heads looking at other ideas of how we can do things differently how we can outsource things how we can use seasonal work you know and, and you know find out new ways to do things and and maybe there's some things that we don't need to be doing some services that you know it doesn't make sense to do in the future and, and that would help drive some of that cost down and get that percentage at a more acceptable level Thank you. The next question, Mr. Bellinger, has to do with cultivating small businesses. Could Sheboygan hold a job fair for local people? Tell them what kinds of small businesses we need. Offer them business advice and tax breaks to begin a business downtown, not in the freeway mall. Mr. Bellinger. 
Uh, could you read that the first part of that question sure. again? Thank you. Could Sheboygan hold a job fair for local people? Tell them what kinds of small businesses we need. Okay, um, we certainly could hold a job fair, uh, and uh, the, the mayor mentioned earlier that he would like to see a, a grocery store in the downtown area. Um, I think developers have been working with the, all the local grocers in town to see if they want to expand there, and apparently there isn't the density to support one at this point in time. Hopefully that changes. But I don't think you can uh, hold a job fair and say we've got these 10 or 12 businesses that we need in our downtown, we want you to fill this niche and this need. You know, what, what we can do, I think, is, is hold a, um, I would call it not necessarily a job fair, an opportunity fair. I would have our existing businesses participate in it and say, you know, here's some other um, opportunities or entrepreneurs that started um, organically, like Olive you know, in places like that. Um, Legend Larry's, who had this great recipe and, and is a local guy who, you know, turned that into a very successful business. You know, things like that, and see if you can spur some ideas in, and be, uh, plant the seed in these young people to see if, if there would be something that would click with them and, and be something that would be of benefit to the city. But for the city to say, here's what we need, these eight or ten or twelve, you know, different businesses, services, or whatever, and say, we want you to fill that need, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's the way it works. I think it needs to be organic. Um, I think the marketplace will drive whatever those needs are, and, you know, hopefully we can have, we have a lot of creative uh, people in the community, but I think, you know, having an opportunity type workshop and having a lot of other people that have been successful in different businesses, doing it a different way, um, I think that might be something that would be educational and spur some creativity and, and maybe plant some seeds and be of future benefit for us. Thank you. Mr. Vandersteen. Uh, I think you're talking about two separate things, as John mentioned. There's a job fair to find jobs for people, but uh, the process of trying to find new businesses to come into our downtown and our city is a little different. Uh, this last year, the Business Improvement District hired some people to go out and knock on the doors of businesses um, in our region and find successful businesses that wanted to expand and maybe open up a Sheboygan location. Now, that hasn't paid any dividends yet, but that, that, that's the kind of thing that I think, you know, you have a chance to, uh, to capitalize on. You talked about Larry Legends. Now, he's out in, in Sheboygan Falls. He's in Manitowoc. He has several locations. So we want to find a business like that that wants to expand and grow. Parker Johns right now is opening up in the riverfront, has a place in Keel. He opened one up in Manitowoc, and now he's opening one up in Sheboygan. So that's kind of like that idea, and that's what we need to do is find those kind of entrepreneurs that have something that's working and have the, uh, the gumption and the money to open up a second or a third location and hopefully we can attract them here. Uh, the other thing that the city does do is, is help many of those businesses out. We can give them business development loan that's based on job creation. We can help them out with some sign grants and, um, and so some small programs like that that we can use to help those businesses along. Uh, Barbershop, Mavericks down on A Street, uh, we helped them out with a facade renovation because we wanted a more historic look for that building. Uh, we gave uh, the yarn shop a sign grant. So there's many uh, little things that we can do and if they do create more jobs like A Street Ale House, uh, they, they bought the building next door and they want to expand their brewery business. Well, as they create those new jobs, they'll qualify for additional funds from the Redevelopment Authority to help cover that. Um, we gave a loan to um, Neil Gottlieb, who uh, runs the Three Twins ice cream shop in the Old Zer Heidi space. And uh, not only has he fixed that building up, it's producing uh, ice cream to serve his company for the Midwest distribution and the East Coast, but now he's fixing up all the buildings and we're going to have a much more attractive spot on Michigan Avenue. Those buildings had been just let go and they were looking very deplorable and now they're really shaping up and looking real sharp and they're employing quite a few people inside of that building. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vandersteen, you'll start with this question. It has to do with the fire department. You want to study on the Sheboygan Fire Department, but will you follow the findings? Why spend $60,000? 
Three firemen were approved to be hired, yet they were not. I would like to know why. Spending money that we don't intend to follow is not fiscally responsible. Mr. Vanderstein. The, um, the study that comes out will have recommendations and that will be up to uh, the fire department and the city council to adopt and fund any recommendations that are in that study. So it's really going to be dependent on, on uh, those two entities. The police and fire commission uh, is also going to be involved in something like that. And uh, you know, I, I hope they come up with several recommendations which can make our, our city's fire department more efficient and uh, perhaps operate a little bit less expensively. But on the other hand, they may make recommendations that are going to cost us more money and we're going to have to find a way to fund those if we want to really have a well-run fire department. So I'm open to see what they come up with and what that might cost and then make the decision uh, as to which way we should go. Thank you. Um, I too, I, I'm curious to see what would come if we were able to spend the, the, the $59,000 to do this study. It would take six months. There would be two phases. Uh, it would be a very, very comprehensive study. It would look at the ambulance service, uh, whether the, vi the viability of that. It would look at the number of stations that we ne need to have as a city, where they should be geographically located. It would be looking at the management, how it should be staffed, as well as the rank and file, how it should be staffed as well. We keep hearing about complaints on the south side that there's only two uh, firemen at that station and on the north side station there's only two firemen there as well and there's um, when there's calls for service in those areas there's a delay as a result and I think what we really need to do is get to the bottom of it and figure out what we need to do there's a battalion chief issue too with their uh, not being on 24s they're on 40-hour work weeks and uh, they don't work weekends or holidays and uh, so those duties are led to the rank and file and and there's some issues with that as well so I think we need to finally get to the bottom of it and again as I mentioned all the way through six years ago this year recently when the study came up I have no preconceived notion of what should come out of it I am not a uh, public protection and safety expert all I want is a five to ten year plan moving forward that the city of Sheboygan can have the most efficient economical and state-of-the-art um, fire service fire protection that, that we can and again if it means that we need to spend more money then we need to find a way to fund it if it means we need to cut some things then we need to do that as well if it means we need to reconfigure things we need to do that too uh, you know so I, I think it you know for from someone to say you know there here's what's going to come out of this nobody knows what's going to come out of it but you know we need to move forward and do something the status quo isn't working the chiefs 2020 plan uh, has some fiscal restraints we've got uh, spending limits spending caps that we have and that would bust the spending caps therefore we would have to lay off other employees eliminate other services you know and I don't think the council has the appetite to to be able to or to want to do that so we need to move forward with this study and, and see what we can have come forth and then look at it and make some decisions thank you Mr. Bellinger You'll answer this question first. It has to do with sister cities. Relationships between countries is an important topic throughout history. Relationships between cities in different countries help build this unity. How will you promote relations with other countries? Uh, I would follow through with, with, you know, with the sister cities that we have, and, and I, would, I would look forward to um, you know, in, enhancing those relationships. Um, I know uh, Mike has a plan to go to Germany with a sister city there and, and spend some time. They were here recently. I know that there's exchange students that go back and forth. I think that's a, a, a cultural um, advantage both for you know the people here in Sheboygan as well as the people in the sister city. So I, I would move forward and, and continue with that and and you know build on it where there's opportunity to build on it. I think. Uh, you know, using the schools um, and having more exchange students going back and forth each way, you know, that might be expanding that program, uh, might be an opportunity, but I would take what we have and, um, and, and build on what we have. And I don't know if I would necessarily expand to other countries. I think, you know, you want, don't want to spread yourself too thin with the resources that you have, but certainly the ones that we've established relationships with, I think we need to keep them strong and, and build on them and, and see what uh, new opportunities we can develop as you know mutual friends and, and sister cities. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Vandersteen. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, Esslingen is our uh, sister city for coming up on 50 years now, and it's been a great relationship over the years. Um, People to People is the organization that uh, uh, made this possible, brought the project forward to the city, and the city adopted. You know, it's really interesting, two years ago, when uh, the mayor of, uh, of Esslingen, Germany, was here, uh, one of the things that he did is participated in our, our Memorial Day parade, and then he went down to the Hmong uh, services that we had for Memorial Day. And, you know, this gentleman was facing the, the, these, all these refugees that were supposed to be coming into Germany and other areas. He knew that this was going to happen. And he was able to see what happened here in the United States in Sheboygan when the Hmong who came here some 30 years ago, he can see now that this group of people has kind of kept their language, kept their customs, uh, but yet they consider themselves Sheboyganites, Americans. And so that gave him, I think, a vision to help him through some of the decisions that he and his city council had to make as their area was inundated with, uh, with different uh, refugee populations. And one of the decisions that they made, which I thought was really good, is that rather than try to take all the refugees and put them in one spot in the city, they chose to disperse them throughout the city and find mentor families to, to take them in and help them out. Much like many of our churches did here in the United States as the Hmong populations, and now even today Burmese populations are coming into Sheboygan and making this their home. So it was a great experience to have. Um, the, um, the, the, the exchanges of students has been also a real uh, interesting thing to observe. You know, it's just amazing how we get some of these kids to go over there for three weeks and make a friend while they're in middle school. And then when their chance comes in high school, they want to go back and continue that relationship and grow it. We've got some challenges is that uh, in our Sheboygan Area School District, we're not teaching too much German anymore, and that's the classes we used to depend on in order to build a group of, of kids to participate in that exchange. And now we're, we're really pushing everything on to the middle school exchange where seven or eight kids will go back and forth and they'll have a, a, a family exchange. And, uh, and that group is really driving uh, all of the student exchanges in high school. And now the, the Germans have to package uh, a, a German class for all these students because they haven't gotten a German class when they were here in the United States. But it's been a great relationship. The only other thing that's out there is we do have another sister city in Tsubami, Japan. And that relationship had been left go by some of the past administrations, and I've been trying to uh, rejuvenate that, but we still haven't really gotten that one to where it should be. So that's the challenge that's out there uh, during the next four years that I'd like to tackle. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Vanderstein, you'll answer this question first. This library and other city agencies deal with homeless people every day. And we know that the Sheboygan Area School District has over 200 homeless students. It's true that the county is in charge of providing services, but is there anything that the city can do to address homelessness and the greater issue of poverty? It's a bigger problem than many of us appreciate. I agree with you that it is a much bigger problem. I used to be on the Big Brothers and Big Sisters Board of Directors, and um, one of the things that Tim Caker would do is, uh, is take the board and put them in front of some of the social workers that go out there and go into all these homes in Sheboygan. And the stories that you, they, they told you, you just couldn't believe. The, the way people are living uh, in some, some homes, uh, at least they have a roof over their heads, but not much else. And, and also some of the, the, the you know, the, the situations that these kids come from, and that's why they need a mentor in their life uh, to kind of uh, raise them up and, and show them that there's, there's a better life out there. But um, the other project that I was involved with is there's a group of churches that banded together over at the Salvation Army. They uh, put together a program this year for February, so they got volunteers, they trained them, they got the cots and the blankets and everything that was needed. And for uh, the month of February, they uh, housed uh, whoever was homeless over there. It, uh, they thought it was something that would be busting at the seams. It really wasn't quite that, but they did play a, a real role in the lives of some of those people. And they also did some work to, uh, some social work along the way to help those people out of the, the, the poverty situation and the homelessness that they were experiencing. 
And it was great to see different members of our community come together, volunteer to do this, and I think that effort's just going to grow this next year. So when it's the coldest uh, time of the year, we'll have a, a place for people to go and uh, get them out of the cold. Thank you. Um, it, it's a terribly sad problem, you know, to be dealt with, and I think all too often it is, um, it's kind of swept under the rug and, and people aren't aware of it and it doesn't receive the publicity or the attention that it really needs. And I, I think there's things that the city can do to, to help alleviate that. Uh, working closer with uh, Salvation Army, with the churches, with the school district. Uh, what I would do is I, I would like to you know, have some meetings with the school district, whether it's the teachers, the administrators, or the principals of these different schools, and, and find out what the unique challenges and problems are with, with uh, the, the homeless kids that they do have. Obviously, there's you know, the, uh, you know, the, where they're going to spend their evenings and, you know, and their, when the time when they're not in school and how they're going to be fed and clothed. You know, but you know, what are the other, you know, there's educational issues too that need to be addressed, you know, to keep these kids uh, up to par and, and, and get them so they can get themselves out of the situation that they're in. And so I, I think we can work with the school district and, and bring some more light to that and, and make uh, people more aware of what's going on. And so we see what challenges that are there, we can address them. Um, I would do the same thing with the churches. I would, I would make the churches aware of, of uh, the intent that the city would like to put a spotlight on this problem and have them uh, make us aware of some unique situations with families or with issues that, that they see in their community, in their faith community, and, and see if there's something that, that we may be able to do to, to help them as well or help them shed some more light on it um, and, and do things with, with the faith community too. I just think that there's there's a lot more that, that can be done and should be done and um, it, it's in, unfortunately a, just a sad, sad situation and it's it's all too prevalent in our in our city and I think it's ignored you know to some great extent but um, I, again I, I think what we can do a great start would be shedding some more light on it and becoming aware of specific problems and addressing specific needs. Mr. Ballinger, this question. Walmart has decided to downvalue its property and pay Sheboygan less. Can we control Walmart and promote local <coughs> entrepreneurs? Uh, no, we cannot control Walmart. Walmart is a huge animal and uh, you know they're you know they're looking to you know do what they can to reduce their costs, you know, at it seems like any expense necessary. Uh, there is some state legislation with uh, uh, going through and they're trying to eliminate these big box stores from uh, devaluing their, their taxes that are owed to their different municipalities where they're in and, and limiting that. So on a state level that is being addressed. Locally, you know, what we can do is we can promote our individual, um, you know, our stores, our businesses, our entrepreneurs and say, you know, and try to do as much as we can to support them. Uh, give them as much recognition, um, as much publicity and, and help uh, that we can to have them succeed. Um, it, it's greater, you know, you feel, um, you, you feel a greater sense uh, when you actually go to one of these small businesses like an Olivu, you know, and, and spend money and, and you're helping somebody that is from the area, it's a smaller uh, shop and uh, you're feeling that you're really making a difference. Uh, you know, you don't really feel that you're you know, making a, a, a big difference when you go to Walmart and you spend your money there. I mean, that those families that own Walmart are already pretty well off and, you know, you don't feel like you're, you know, contributing to the greater good like you would be, you know, if you're doing it at a smaller shop. So, again, I think what we need to do is put more publicity and emphasis um, as a community, as, as a city, on, on local businesses and seeing what we can do to help them and, and raise, um, you know, their profile in the community and, and make people aware of how many great opportunities we have with the companies that are housed here within our city. Thank you. Mr. Vandersteen. Could you please repeat the question? Yes, <coughs> I can. Walmart has just decided to downvalue its property and pay Sheboygan less. Can we control Walmart and promote local entrepreneurs? 
um, the uh, what they call a dark store uh, philosophy of, of assessment is uh, rampant in our area right now. It's hit us hard with uh, Walgreens and also with uh, Memorial Mall. We had to pay quite a bit of taxes back to both of those organizations. The um, uh, League of Municipalities is working hard to uh, sell the idea to our legislature that they should implement some new uh, laws that are similar to what are going on right now in Indiana. Uh, they've tried it in, in Michigan and those didn't quite work out, but the Indiana uh, solution seems to be the best one and seems to be effective so that these uh, big box companies can't win these assessment uh, cases uh, in court. Uh, so. If we are able to pass that legislation uh, before uh, a question would come up with another one, we will be able to defeat Walmart and any other company that tries to do that. So I'm working aggressively with the League of Municipalities to support that and convince our local legislators that they should uh, sign on to that legislation. Thank you. And now it is time for concluding remarks um, by our candidates. They each have one minute, and Mr. Vandersteen, you will begin. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the members of the AAUW for uh, putting this event together. Uh, you know, we had some other sponsors in the past, and, and that uh, fell apart. And so thank you for picking up the moniker and, and having a debate like this. It's very important for our community. Um, you know, the, the last four years as mayor, I've, I've tried to make some real positive changes. Roads have been a priority, communication, uh, trying to do better things for our, uh, our employees, and, uh, and try to overcome some of the problems that came along with Act 10. We still have a lot of employees that are really, really not feeling too good about uh, their employment after the way they were treated after Act 10, and we need to do some work to, to change that. But, you know, I've been trying to uh, work to build a better Sheboygan. I hope that together we can do that over the next four years. And thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bellinger. Thank you. Uh, Deb, thank you very much. You did a very good job. I appreciate the opportunity. Dolce, thank you for organizing this. It, again, an outstanding job. And, and uh, everybody that came and people that are watching at home or will see it taped uh, later, thank you. Um, hopefully we highlighted some of our differences here tonight. Um, you know, some of the things that, that I want to make very evident to the, the electorate out there when it comes time on Tuesday to vote is there's a great difference between how Mike and I view things and how we would move things forward. Um, I oppose the sales tax. Uh, Mike supported it. Um, I'm fought for the 200% the increase in borrowing. You know, Mike supported that. Um, I'm leading an, an effort to eliminate road assessments. Mike's in favor of it. Um, I oppose the five-year capital borrowing for $31 million, doubling our debt and uh, putting our AA2 bond rating in jeopardy. You know, Mike supported that. You know, and I'm continually looking at cost savings and efficiencies. I want to thank all of you for your participation. And